in this um, second part of this morning conference, we have two uh, presentations. The first, of, the, the first of them will be uh, by our colleagues from Brussels, Nadia Everard and Noé Morin. Well, the, they are um, they are leading uh, also uh, very good uh, activities in the middle of Europe, the center of Europe, uh, connected with the association Le Table Ronde pour l'Architecture. And they are uh, now presenting uh, their lecture called Teaching Architecture and Crafts, the Spirit of Companionship. Thank you very, very much, Nadia. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you um, uh, for, for hosting us and, uh, and for organizing this uh, wonderful event. And I would like to thank especially, and I hope I will not uh, miss uh, anyone, uh, the Traditional Building Cultures Foundation, the Serra Enriquez Foundation, the International Network for Traditional Building Architecture and Urbanism, namely uh, INBO, and uh, of course, uh, CALAM. Uh, I am Noé Morin, the, uh, this is Nadia Evrard, and we are the founders of uh, La Table Ronde de l'Architecture. It's also the Belgian chapter of uh, INBO, based in, in Bruges uh, since uh, recently, and uh, with which we organize uh, an annual uh, uh, summer school of architecture and crafts. And in this uh, presentation, uh, Nadia will talk uh, mainly about the teaching work uh, of our association, and, and I will, if, if you allow me, begin by summarizing the uh, intellectual path that um, has led us to, to do what we do. Um, so to begin with, um, we would like to say that our world has become so far removed from nature that we now have to uh, rediscover through research and study solutions that were once uh, very well known. Uh, we are rediscovering the thermal inertia of, of the earth, uh, the cooling powers of trees, the longevity of solid wall construction, the usefulness of sloping roofs and the benefits of lime. This practical knowledge, uh, which our ancestors mastered perfectly, is tradition. Tradition is nothing more than that. It's a body of knowledge accumulated over the centuries, passed down from parent to child, to mas from master to pupil, from companion to apprentice for years. And these traditions constitute a language that unites the members of the same professional community and represent an indisputable source of authority. And this is why in traditional societies, the bearers of traditions, namely the elders, generally have the moral authority conferred on them by their seniority and their knowledge of the past. And incidentally, the opposite is true in modern societies our societies are more inclined to favor youth and take a very dim view of aging, a clear sign that they no longer believe in the superior moral value of tradition. In the course of uh, this presentation, we will come back to what now characterizes moral authority in modern societies. But for the sake of, of brevity, allow me to move on immediately to the next stage of our reasoning. Gradually from the Renaissance onwards, we see the emergence of a dual phenomenon, which after several centuries leads to the replacement of tradition by science as a source of authority and knowledge. This phenomenon is illustrated first and foremost by the separation in the arts of the beauty and the utility. In the past, art and technique were linked. From Greek or Latin antiquity to, to medieval Christianity, art and science, beauty and utility went hand in hand. In the same way, the division between manual and intellectual professions was not as clear cut as it is today. The manual and the intellectual were often inseparable. And the first separation of the beautiful from the useful, the intellectual from the manual, we could say the mind from the body, occurred during the Renaissance. It was in 14th century Florence that the humanists chose to split the liberal arts which comprised three disciplines, dialectics, grammar, and rhetoric, and to give pride of place to grammar and rhetoric, leaving dialectics to one side. But dialectic was the most intellectual of the liberal arts because it requires a logical sense and reasoning. It is by definition less artistic than grammar and rhetoric. So the turning point came with the Italian humanism, which preferred the artistic to the logical 
and without realizing it, opened a breach in history that would contribute to separating the beautiful from the useful. Art without utility, art for art's sake, art devoid of meaning, is no longer in pursuit of truth. It can therefore become insignificant, and I think contemporary art is a perfect illustration of this, while utility becomes the prerogative of nascent industry. From the Renaissance onwards, and even more so since the triumph of the modern state, we have accepted the following. For beautiful, meaningless things, there is art. And for useful things that don't have to be beautiful, there is industry. In this context, craftsmanship, which was the perfect marriage of the beautiful and the useful, loses all reason to exist. So it disappears while an architecture develops that looks more and more like a product of mass industry, standard, conforming, and prefabricated. We have taken this um, long diversion into history to show you that the, the world we live in and the architecture that we build are the result of the development of civilization. We have reached a stage in the historical process where architecture is being forced to take its place either among the beautiful and insignificant or among the useful products of industry. Add to this the development of the scientific spirit, which in the 19th century became so widespread that it gradually replaced all previous sources of knowledge. The scientific discourse replaced God, whose death Nietzsche first noted at the end of the 19th century, but it also replaced tradition. Suddenly, tradition ceased to be passed on, and young people in search of truth turned away from their forebears. Instead, they turned their ears to the scientists, who were making extraordinary leaps forward in our understanding of man and his environment. The moral authority that once belonged to religion and tradition is inexorably passing to scientists and researchers. This transition involved the whole society, which gradually allowed itself to be guided by the laws of science, even in areas that were foreign to it, such as the government. Uh, I think it's Saint-Simon speaking of the administration of things that replaced the, the government of the people, and as well as the economics, which tends more and more to present a character of scientificity and absolute truth. The same thing is happening to architecture, which is slowly distancing itself from the oral and written tradition and beginning to be fascinated by new technologies and large numbers. This is when gigantism and the construction of large housing estates come into being. Today, when you talk to an architect or worker about an architectural process as simple as a discharging arch, for, for instance, they look at you suspiciously before asking if this ancestral technique, which does not appear in the Bible of modernism, is really trustworthy. And yet, it is a tried and test technique that has been used for centuries, but the modernist architect is suspicious of anything old. From now on, tradition worries and novelty reassures. This is not just a result of a lack of culture, it is an intuition deeply rooted in the human psyche that leads modern human beings that, that we are, to believe unconditionally in the superiority of technological discoveries compared with the old recipes of tradition. And this belief runs deep in most of our contemporaries and to get rid of it, we would have to write off modernity and measure once and for all the real contribution of technology to our lives. Because very often the technology responds to problems that it has itself caused. But it's not the purpose of this talk. The purpose of this talk after telling you that we are the fruit of history is to present the modest solutions that we have developed to rediscover and teach traditional architecture. Not because we are nostalgic or backward looking, but because we believe that if contemporary architecture does not change through contact with tradition, it will disappear. So I'm now going to hand over to Nadia. We'll talk to you about how we have tried to, to put our theories into uh, practice. When we set up our association in 2020, we talked about how to change architecture, because it seems to us that architecture cannot continue as it is. In terms of available resource and the pollution they cause, millions of tons of concrete, glass, and metal are spread around the world and are running out. When they are exhausted or deemed too polluting, we will have to revert to the natural materials that are available in abundance, 
such as earth and stone. And to do this, builders will have to be trained in their use. In this context, tradition will become essential. It will be useful to recognize the right stone for building and knowing how and where to use it. Architects and workers will have to relearn that what is good here is sometimes bad elsewhere because of climate, habits, and the quality of materials. In the shorter term, the rapid obsolescence of new buildings pose an even more serious challenge to the construction sector, which is increasingly resembling a bottomless pit into which public and private authorities are throwing immense materials and financial resources at a total loss. Finally, because of its appearance as a standard commercial product, nowadays architecture is at the earth of a new crisis. If things continue at their current pace, we believe that architects will disappear because their contribution to the design of a building will have become so mediocre and minimal that they will be easily replaced by artificial intelligence. It has therefore become clear to us that despite the vigorous protests from the profession and the university against our analyze, which they wrongly, wrongly take as personal attacks, it is for the survival of architects and the construction profession that we are fighting. We are fighting to ensure that in a hundred years time, architects will not be replaced by artificial intelligence and construction workers by the machine. Their survival depends on learning a unique, demanding and irreplaceable science. To survive, they have to become skilled again. You can change all the rules, rewrite all the laws, and convince property developers to invest all the money in the world in traditional projects. But if you don't have well-trained architects and craftsmen with a perfect command of drawing, geometry, and local building tradition, you will always be missing the essential, and the architecture you, pr you produce won't be convincing. That is why we realized that the most urgent task facing us was to set up a school. The history of art and architecture follows schools from the workshop of the Companion in France to the school of Rome, which inspired the Italian Quattrocento, from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris to the Saint-Luc workshops in Belgium and the Bows, architecture renews itself from the bottom up through its schools. More recently, new summer schools of architecture have sprung up all over Europe, in the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, the UK, Poland, and elsewhere. In view of their huge success, we too have decided to set up a school, the Bruges Summer School for Architecture and Crafts. At the moment, it is, it is just a summer school, but in a few years' time, we have the firm intention of making it a permanent school. It is a place dedicated to discussion and study, free from the ideological blinkers of the academy, free from any pressure. We want this school to be a haven where we can learn from the richness of our tradition and develop a new moral philosophy. If you will allow us to borrow a phrase from Rabelais, I hope I, I will say this well in English, architecture without conscience is but the ruin of the soul. We want our students to understand why it is advantageous to use a particular materials in a particular place or a particular process in another, and that very often style is simply the result of geology, the avail availability of resource and climate. We don't want our students to be drawn in the, the immense catalogs of styles like many 19th century architects face with the prodigality of archeological discovery and to make the mistake of using tradition lightly. We are in search of a reasonable architecture. This is a perilous guest quest. It requires reflection and humility. Nothing could be more damaging than a superficial approach to tradition that leads us to borrow from every period and every style without having solid reason for doing so. Using Egyptian symbolism in Portugal or transposing Scandinavian construction technique to Morocco would, have, would, would make no sense. We need to show restraint in the face of the immense wealth and traditional language. The temper and temper our enthusiasm with, with pragmatism and seriousness. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, right simple, in his epistle to the Thessalonians. We agree with simple, in architecture, nothing is meaningless, everything must be justified. Why do we insist on this? Because we are at the dawn of a renaissance in architecture, led by courageous architects and craftsmen, some of whom are here today. 
This Renaissance is both ambition and fragile, ambitious and fragile. We don't want to compromise it. If we make the mistake of teaching our students to play with style, mix symbol, and use materials as they please, we risk provoking a powerful purist back backlash like history has already witnessed. The advent of modernism at the beginning of the 20th century is not unrelated to what Auguste Pugin called the carnival of architecture that prevailed at the beginning of the 19th century. We must not overlook the powerful driving force of purism and the hatred of abundance and profusion that lies at the earth of modernism. We don't want our school to be used as a pretext for a purist reaction. Our architecture is not carnivalesque. Our teaching must not be fanciful. The best way to ensure that our teaching is not fanciful is to work closely with the craftsmen. Indeed, a rift separates craftsmen from architects, pushing the ladder toward abstract creation detached from any materials constraint behind their computer screen, immersed in the in real, in real cosmos of architectural software, architects are gods, creating perfect geometry shapes from, from nothing. These forms have no texture, no roughness, no weight, and no imperfection. Thanks to the magic of computers and concrete, anything is possible. Only contact with craftsmen and materials can awaken architects from the virtual hallucination in which they are immersed. This is why our school is a school of architecture and craft. Without the marriage of architecture and craft, it will be impossible to achieve what Violet Le Duc called reasoned architecture, namely architecture that originates from the materials and not from the theory. That is why the curriculum of our summer school gives an important place to, to manual trades. Our students are first invited to observe traditional building techniques, to draw their characteristics, and to study their properties. This initial observation phase is essential. Secondly, our students are invited to discover stone masonry, carpentry, roofing, and plastering, among other disciplines. We put materials in their hands. They understand that materials have a will of their own and a logic of their own. And suddenly, the traditional vocabulary seems intelligible and obvious. Suddenly, they understand everything, masonry technique, the laying of stone, wooden assembly process, the use of lime. During the second half of the summer school, they understand the, re the technical reason for what they observed during the first half of our summer school. That is when they realize the vital link between craftsmanship and architecture. And some of our students change career path completely and choose to abandon architecture to devote themselves to crafts. Because in their eyes, craftsmanship is no longer museum folklore. And craftsmen are no longer the dinosaur we show off every year at Heritage Days. By the end of our summer school, craftsmanship has become for them the source of all architecture and craftsmen the holders of priceless knowledge. Finally, and, and, and we will end here, we want our students to have good intention. We want to spare them the authoritarian delusion of 20th century architecture. We want to spare them the temptation of the total control of modernism, urbanism, and give them a taste for freedom. But a taste for freedom is not acquired in the brutal competitive world at the university, as we know it. In packed auditoriums in front of solitary professors lecturing to the mass, or in the humiliating juries that crown the university teaching of architecture. The students at this university are taught a false freedom that consists of saying, fuck the context, do what you want. But as you know, freedom requires order, and that order is the vocabulary of tradition. If you don't learn this vocabulary properly, which is the basis of architectural language, you won't be free. For our part, we believe that freedom is acquired through contact with one's peers, with a school that is benevolent and conducive to discussion and through the transmission of a language that should enable each student to be perfectly free and not find himself obliged to speak the impoverished language of modernism for lack of anything better. That is why the spirit of companionship is with us every step of the way. The spirit of companionship is first and foremost the solidarity of a group working together. Anyone who has ever cut stone or shaped wood know that in order to build a wall or a framework, all the workers have to do their individual jobs properly if the collective wall is to stand up. Craftsmanship based on the solidarity of the parties involved compensates for the solitude of the architects. Through craftsmanship, it is not the ego of a single individual that is expressed, but the success of a group. To shine, you have to make other shines. 
a sculptor will always be able to derive a certain amount of glory from his personal contribution to a cathedral, for example. But when it's finished, the cathedral will be the culminating expression of collective genius. And that collective genius on which the pride of a group rests will be the basis of a new community. What we are trying to achieve on our modest scale at our school in Bruges, through manual work and the teaching of tradition, is to create a, a community. In a world increasingly marked by individualism and the, tri the triumph of social Darwinism, we need to create islands of solidarity and mutual support. More important than the teaching we provide, what strikes the students during the summer school is the relief of having found their, their place within a family. And this family is the closest thing we have to the spirit of companionship. We will end here so as not to be too long uh, with a, a short video of our summer school. And we are, of course, open to all your questions uh, after the video. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry, this uh, is scripted. We, we, we felt uh, not comfortable enough in English to uh, improvise in front of you.
So sorry for the sound. Uh, it was Tchaikovsky playing, and I hope you had a glimpse <laughs> of. Uh, but uh, that was the image. They, these were the images of uh, last year, this year actually, summer school, and uh, with the participation of uh, Jose and uh, Robert. Uh, Irene was there as well, uh, actually, and. Um, and uh, yes, so this, this time, this year, it's the first year we really try to meddle um, architecture and the crafts and, and, and for, for them to, to take architecture as seriously as, uh, as craftsmen. So, so yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia Noe. Uh, any, any question, please? Yes, hi. Um, I, I, it seems that you guys have said all what needs to be said regarding traditional architecture, but uh, I have a question. You mentioned uh, uh, man-made versus machine-made. So my question is that what makes a man-made stone column more valuable than a machine-made one? Um, actually, um, what, what we like in uh, art pieces is the fact that uh, they have been made by humans. Otherwise, we would have very little interest uh, into uh, going to museums for uh, seeing uh, Joconde or any um, major paintings uh, that have been realized by a machine, for instance. Uh, although this uh, art piece made by a machine uh, can be as perfect uh, as the, the Joconde itself, but what what we do like in in arts and I think in crafts is um, is the the the, the freedom, uh, the possibility of failure that expresses uh, through um, the um, artist's uh, work, and um, and so I think uh, that uh, if art and the crafts are becoming made by machines tomorrow. We will have very little interest into uh, into their production, and we will very easily allow them to become standardized product because our interest primarily goes, I think, into the human work uh, behind, not the aesthetic perfection of the work. I think also um, when you look at a piece of, you know, um, crafts, what's also amazing is all the love, you know, the time, the the passion that has been made in. In, in you know in in real uh, things um all of this cannot be achieved by machines it's only can only be made by human so i think it's also i mean uh, personally when i i visit you know um, a building that just um transcended um, me it's 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 not only because of the beauty but also i mean all that beauty when you think about it, the cathedral for example is of the, that collective work you know that collective human work uh, every piece is made to work with the the other one um but the the because you were talk, talking uh, before us um about um, religion you know and the spirit spirituality uh, behind this um i think this is also very important the um, all the symbolic behind um the intention the time, but the love, you know, yeah, the love be behind craft, uh, that's only, can, it can only be achieved by human. It's, that's just, yeah. And then finishing by hand. You see, pardon. Uh, what, what about mixed techniques that start with the biggest gross work done by machines and then hand finished? I think somehow today in some country we don't have the, the choice. Uh, in Belgium, for example, for instance, it's impossible to build a building from the beginning to the end only uh, by hands. It's just impossible because of regulation, because of the, because there is we don't have competent craftsmen. Uh, even if you train them, you need the time, and it's very complicated. So, um, I've, I've I've designed something like that in the Alsace region. Um, no concrete, no no plastic. But it's it's very difficult. I mean, it can be achieved. We we, we so many examples, but it it needs a lot of dedication and time. And I think this has to be um, it, it it will take time anyway. But it, it, 
I, that's why schools and education are highly important. I think we don't have only, only to train architects, but we have to have more craftsmen and competent craftsmen. Because as you were saying uh, before, um, we are taking a lot of time, you know, um, as, as an architect or a master builder on site to explain to the craftsmen, workers, as we are calling them today, how to do things, because often tradition have just been losses. So we need school, I think, that are not only for architects, but also craftsmen. That, that it's a, a, an holistic approach uh, of the architecture. And this will help us to, to, to do something better. But about the machine, what you were saying is that today for the structure, I mean, for example, in Belgium, if we want to build somehow traditionally, it will not never be perfect because of the time we are living in. Um, bricks are made by machines. I mean, we visited most of the brick factory in Belgium. They are made by mach machines. Uh, doing brick by hands, that's just, it, it's, it's just not possible. So that's one thing, but that, then it will be laid by hand. That's the first step. It's already very good if we manage to do that. Uh, to, to build with bricks, uh, solid wool, uh, load bearing wool. I think that's a, a solution for many countries in Europe uh, for you know, winter and summer. It's, it has so much qualities in it. It has been used for millennia. Why, why are we, you know, you're not, you, we are looking for high tech solution when low tech, what we call low tech today, traditional in front of our eyes and, and um, we just need to rediscover it. And that's why I think education is highly import important if we want also the construction industry to change. Um, it's, it's our task, you know, to educate um, um, ourselves and the next generation. And if I, if I may add, Irene, um, the, the more we delegate to the skills to the machines uh, or tools, um, <clears throat> the less we are ourselves cap capable of uh, doing stuff. No, no. Uh, you know, I'm barely uh, able to write uh, by hand. I had to type this text and realized that if I had to write three pages by hand, I would I would not make it, you know. So, so we are losing skills uh, because we are delegating uh, uh, every human um, uh, activity to the machines. And in the end, what will remain of the human is is a uh, is preoccupying subject. So um, um, my my concern is is more about uh, the qu the quality of human beings around and their capacity to craft and to rather than the perfection of the and and the speed and the efficiency with which products have been made. I just wanted to make the constant, or how you say the constant, mm -hmm. uh, that in the current situation, you need to make compromises. Of course. And, and uh, that it's very, very important what mm -hmm. you're saying. Yes, yes, that's all. I think that the key mother, it depends on your context, of course, and the context of the project, but the key mother nowadays, as we have to compromise, as you said, um, is that at least you design everything in a way that could be done traditionally. And then you will get as much as you can. Sometimes it will be more. Sometimes you will have to compromise more. But at least you have designed it in a way that it can be done. Um, from that point, if we little by little, with little achievements here and there, encourage this uh, um, fabric of uh, craftsmanship to, to flourish again, then we will be able to come closer to our goal. But I think it, that will take time. Yes, I think that we could I think, talk about the machine. I don't know if you accept this as a tool uh, for the human achievement, not as an end in itself. We will always need machines. If you want to write by hand, you need a pen. So the pen can improve. I think if we have this in mind, perhaps there's not danger in the machine. I just want to offer you the, the, uh, the key the thing about technology. Technology does what you want to do better and cheaper. That's all. That's all the technology ever does. So if, you don't, if, it, if it's not delivering something you want, you shouldn't be doing it. The idea that technology determines things is not true. Human beings determine things. So. If you, you know, if you want to cut up a piece of wood, and it's a very big piece of wood, a mechanical saw might save you a lot of bother. Um, but it does what you want to do better and more efficiently. But if it isn't what you want to do, you shouldn't do it. 
may, may, may I disagree, uh, Robert? Um, because um, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm a big reader of uh, Lewis Mumford, whom you know, the American historian, and uh, saying that um, a technique, technology is not neutral in the sense that if you start using certain techniques, and we see that in construction, if you start um, um, giving giving it away to, um, to, 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 to mass production, prefabrication, uh, on concrete, and then there's a, there's a point to which, uh, past which you cannot go back and, 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 or very, very, you have to, 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 it takes a lot of effort to come back to old techniques because first you, you have uh, just uh, f forgotten them. So you have to reacquire skills and you are not free to do something that you uh, are not uh, able, you know, that you don't master. In the end, it's not doing something you wanted to do. That's all. Mm. You know, if, if you don't want to do it, you shouldn't do it. It's, it's really very simple. Yes. And, and if it's taking you to the wrong place, then don't do it. But, but if it's useful, um, and not taking you to the wrong place and you do it, it's fundamental. Technology just does what you want to do, you, not, not anything else, better. Yes, yeah, that's what we try to do, actually, but we live in a society which, uh, you know, has a general movement that is uh, more and more technological, and uh, at, at one point we find it very hard to refuse a certain inventions just for the sake that we find that they are morally uh, um, uh, not not good, you know. So um, uh, there's a trend to ever increasing technology presence with very little uh, consideration on the moral um, uh, changes that it brings about in human nature and stuff. And um, sometimes we feel that we are trapped because uh, we cannot just refuse the, the progress. Yeah. Presented with a, a new mechanical contraption turned the engineer away and said, no, I need to feel my, I need to feed my commons. In other words, I don't want your machine because I need to employ people to feed them. And so it really, back then, technology was being rejected because it was not serving the right purpose. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, ex and, uh, if I can come back to that example of brick factories in Belgium, because I mean, we, we the association based, is based there. Um, the, the problem is that, as you know, if, if you use bricks uh, in your country, um, you have bricks of different kinds, different, uh, they have, they are cooked differently and you are putting them in a different, in different place, depending on their cooking, depending on their consistency and, and so on. Uh, the problem with manufacturers today is that they are like making bricks disappearing. They are becoming smaller and smaller, just cladding. It's not structural anymore. Um, so for that, I think uh, the problem is uh, the profession of architects and the education that does not teach solid wall uh, construction anymore. But also the product, um, if you want to do traditional architecture, even with these industrial um, products made by the machine, um, you cannot have the, the variety that you used to have in, in traditional um, hoven, uh, the new kiln. Uh, and and that's that's also our problem is that I agree that you know um, sometimes you know the machine can really help you know uh, in your work, but at the same time uh, for 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 the sake of you know for at, at what end um, we've done like during the summer school um, a workshop on stone um, stone cutting to make an arch with the students, and I mean I'm doing craft every day because I, I do ceramics. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm um, an architect by profession, by teaching, yeah. Um, so, so for me, it's something, you know, uh, very important. I cannot live with it without it. Uh, but Noé, for example, and most of the students who went there, uh, they discovered, like, what doing something with your hand can bring, you know, to humans. And you cannot imagine... Um, you cannot imagine the, 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 the quality it has without doing it once, at least once in your life. You have to do it. You have to carve stone. You have to do some woodwork. Um, because when you, when, you, when you found the qualities of this, it changed your life completely. And you cannot build with concrete, with, um, you know, with industrial materials anymore. It's, it's just impossible. There is something really um, intense, something very special um, with craft, with, you know, using your brain and your hands. Um, it's, it's difficult to describe. In English, it's even more complicated. Um, but yeah, I, I, one, one advice I could give, you know, because 
with this school, this is something we try to achieve is educate, you know, in drawing, geometry, but also practical knowledge um, for craftsmen, but architects. We are not a university. We are not a, a, a you know, a, um, a school with a, a diploma that, that is recognized by the EU or by, by the state. Um, people who come to us, it's because of their passion. They want to learn something that will change our life. Um, often it, it does. And I would say this for young and old, older um, but it, an advice would be that if you haven't tried craft could be you know craft doesn't it's not only related to construction but when you do it once you understand why it's so important and why you need we need to we need to maintain it we need to make it uh, alive and that it's not as as i said something that stays you know just in the heritage day that we are looking as something you know very special it, it has to be part of our life uh, again. And I think something in the human uh, spirit, I mean, there is something very dark in our age. I mean, I would say personally, I think there is something very dark. Um, and, and I think human would gain so much by rediscovering the qualities of working with their hands and, and sometimes going away. I mean, I'm, I have a computer, I have a phone, you know, I, I, I'm using the machine because I, I less as possible, um, but, but um, I'm, I'm trying to do as much as possible craft when I have time. And it's, it's yeah, yeah, I'm just talking for nothing now, but it's very important. Um, so, yeah. I just want to clarify what I was talking about was in the, it, what I think that in the education and school uh, programs, absolutely, you have to be radical and go back to manuality. That was the theoretical question about what happens in the practice which is probably out of subject as oxygen, you know? Yeah, <laughs> but, but it's, it's relevant for, for exactly, yeah, yeah. what happens after. Mm -hmm. so, but, but you are here to, to, to remind our youth or our people that it's, it, it was like that, it's impossible and that they should go no, back to learn at least yeah. how to do it. Exactly. For example, we will not, you know, in Bruges, um, we will teach our students how to, how to build a Cyclopean foundation, but we will tell them that I would say most of the time, the craftsmen, I mean, yeah, most of the crime workers, they don't know how to do it. Craftsmen, most of them don't know how to do it. So you will have a, a concrete foundation, but that's a little thing. If you manage at least to have a um, solid wall, you know, so, in, in, in Bruges, for example, solid wall uh, construction methods, pitch roof, um, um, a wood carpentry. Um, if you know, it's step by step. I'm, 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 I know that it's very complicated, uh, and and I practice it. So I, I and and lots of you are practicing it. So I know it's not that simple. I know that in some country there is less regulation. Uh, the access to natural materials is more easy more easy um, you have also um, people um, but but somehow we have to be radical I think in the teaching at least um, if we want you know those students to to really um, believe in it to really understand why it is so important and then to do their best and and it will never be perfect and maybe at their end of their life at the end of my life I will be really proud of one building that is as I, I think you know uh, something that will last for generations. This is the purpose of, uh, you know, is to share something beautiful to the others and not just for ourselves, so, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia and yeah. again. It was for them for a great work in Bruges, in Bruges and uh, in the context of the summer schools, in the context of this network.